My father was a Bangor tiger. One of the old originals. And it's about him that most of my stories tend to be about. But my mother, she was as much a hellion, if not more so. And before I go boasting, it's best if I clarify my lineage on both sides. Now, as I said, my father was a Bangor tiger. One of those famed loggers from the dark state of Maine. <coughs> He'd come from Wales, following his best friend, who had, crazily enough, married the sister of my mother. After five years of logging, my mother's sister, my aunt, had three children in a household that was never quiet. My mother's Bam. sister was <laughs> dead. She, she grew sad. Her husband, my father, told her to wait and to pray for the bounty of the Lord. But in those hard early days of hunger and of sickness, of early frost and dry springs and terrible accidents in the woods, it was often felt by the inhabitants of Bangor, Maine, that the eyes of God were elsewhere. And my mother grew impatient. You see, at that time, there were still parts of these woods that had not been cut down since the beginning of things. Where the old trees grow so close together that to walk into the woods was like walking into a cave. So dark and quiet it was. And it was rumored that in those dark woods, a handsome man in black walked about. Sometimes men would go out looking for him, and they'd come back with the most curious things. Abel King Clay had brought back a coal that never burned out, and he used that coal to light his stove every morning for 14 years until it burned down his house. Danny Brennan came back with a piglet that mumbled something that sounded like words, and so he raised it into a hog. But one day, he left the gate open, and the pig got out and his child. Stuart Wells, he brought back a seedling that grew into a tree that fed off of lightning. And when it fruited, it gave off these little cherries that tasted like rust. Some men will come back with this black powder that may cure an infection, may prevent arthritis, or drive a man into madness. Some men never be back at all. One night, when the moon was full and heavy in the sky, my mother walked alone into the dark woods. She wore her husband's cork boots, and she brought her husband's axe, and she took along a lightning bug and a matchbox just for luck. Just into the woods. The moon faded to almost nothing. She hadn't walked far in this darkness when she came across the handsome man who spoke to her and called her by name. She told the man that she had come to ask him for a favor and the man grinned a grin of perfect white teeth and asked my mother what she wanted. My mother wanted a son. She wanted a son more than she wanted to live, and so she challenged the man to a contest. A woodcutting contest. She wagered her soul that in an hour she could cut down the most trees. And when the man in black took an axe from thin air, she asked, they may not switch axes, being that she is disadvantaged for being a woman. The man smiled at her and handed her the magic axe. This axe gave my mother a strength that she could not believe. And when the handsome man turned an hourglass filled with sand, she found that it only took her a few swings to cut down even the thickest of trees. She would swing the blade no heavier in her hand than a wooden spoon, and with a thud, the axe would sink into the tree as though it was made of wax. But when she glanced over at the man, 
man in black, she saw that he need only hit the tree once. And then he would whisper a word to the crack, and the tree would fall at his command. At the end of this hour, my mother had cut down 17 trees. But the man in black had cut down 19, and he walked towards her with a grin on his face. But my mother stopped him and said that she did not trust in his work. That in whispering to these trees, he may have just put them to sleep. And she would need to come back tomorrow night to make sure they're still on the ground to trust that he had won. The man winked at her and said that he'd be back tomorrow night to collect, and then he disappeared into the shadow of a tree. My mother wasted no time at all. She went back to the town. She woke up her sister. Together, they stole four mules from the lumber stockyard and four 50-pound bags of cement. They went back to the spot where my mother played against the handsome man. They worked all night, setting up those rigs, coaxing the oxen, laying the cement, and when they returned the pigs back to the company pen, that sun was close to rising. The next night, my mother returned to the clearing and the handsome man in black was there waiting for her. She pointed out to him that three of his trees were now standing. And that as far as she could tell, he had only cut down 16. The man in black walked over to one of those trees that he had cut down and my mother and her sister had raised back up and he touched the dried cement that held that tree upright. He grinned. He said, that for winning, my mother would get the son that she wanted. For outsmarting him, she would get to keep the magic axe. But for cheating, her son would have more of the devil in him than she would like. And then he told her to run from the forest. But these dark woods were not safe for anything at this time of night. My mother returned to her husband. Her belly swole up. Some time later, I and screamed to this world. So when I tell you boys that I have a call from Hell-bent to my arm and devilry on my mind to know that I'm not boasting, but simply pleasing my mother, who once outsmarted the devil himself and raised me to tell no lies. soul survivors in this belly of a whale. Its ribs are ceiling beams, its guts are comedy. I guess we have some time to kill. And not remember me, I was a child of three, and you a lad of eight. Charming air, all cheap and debonair. My widow mother felt so sweet. And so she took you in, but she's still warm with him, now filled with filth and foul disease. As time wore on, you proved a dead, ridden, drunken mess, leaving my mother. 
mother of poor consumptive rest. Oh. And then you disappeared, your gambling arrears, the only thing you left behind. And then a magistrate reclaimed our small estates, and my poor mother lost her mind. But before she did, I took her hand as she died and cried. Oh. Find him, find him, tie him to a pole and break his fingers. The ceiling of his grave. It took me fifteen years to Whoa. swallow all my tears amongst the urchins in the streets until a priory took me and hired me to keep them. But never once did the employ of these holy men Did I ever once turn my mind from the thought of revenge? Oh! One night I overheard the prior exchanging words with a penitent well from the sea The captain of a ship Who met you toe to tip Was known for wanton cruelty The following day I shipped to sea with a privateer And in the whistle of the wind I could almost hear Bind him, tie him to a pole and break his fingers to splinters. Drag him to a hole until he wakes up naked, clawing at the ceiling of his grave. One thing that I must say to you and As you sail across the sea Always your mother will watch over you As you avenge this wicked deed Of a 
That you should survive as well as me. It gives my heart great joy to see your eyes fill with fear. So lean in close and I'll whisper the last words you'll ever hear. Light of hand. I've seen a babe born into the arms of a family that cannot want or love it. I've seen cowards triumph while heroes die in the dust. And still the thunderstorms trouble the plains. But worst, worst of all, I've looked inside myself to see the sin of man that can lurk there. At times, it gets so bad that I wonder if perhaps the external world, the rocks, the trees, Everything we see around us serves as nothing but a distraction to keep us from constant introspection. For if we had all nowhere else to look but inward, then we would surely find our way to madness. I first met Roland Smith several years ago in this same place. Roland was a logger, but an awful one. He was a dreamer, and by that I do not mean that he was a seductile man easily drawn into ideas, but that he was literally always dreaming. If you wanted to find Roland, he'd be in his bunk, his eyes trembling furiously beneath their closed lids. In the mornings, over heaping plates of bacon and flapjacks, he would tell us of his insomniac preambulations about what he'd seen when his eyes had been shut. And he would have the most fantastic dreams. He dreamt that a herd of giraffes with nuts in their neck ate strawberries 
off of ponderosa pine trees. He dreamt that men in beaked masks stood beneath a waterfall of fire and snuffed candles for an entire day. He dreamt that it rained so hard that the men found catfish in their boots and had to pry the barnacles off their bedposts with pen knives. And then it got dark, and he looked up. The whale was swimming through the thick rain, blotting out the sun. Now, Nobody paid much mind to Roland Smith and his dreams. Until one day. One day he had a dream that as we lie, each tree we cut fell to the surface of the earth like it was a sheet of paper. Leaving at the end of it three holes that were awful empty. And that day, there was an accident at the sawmill. And three men were killed. And you'd better believe that we began paying very close attention to whatever it was Roland Smith had to say after that. One day, Roland was assigned to begin cutting down a tree with a new logger by the name of Jimmy Finnegan. Jimmy was younger than we took most of him, but his mother moved him on. He was making good pay in the woods. It was Roland's job to holler whenever the tree Jimmy was felling began to tilt. Roland fell asleep. And Jimmy was killed. When Roland realized what he'd done, he walked back to camp, climbed into his bunk, and immediately closed his eyes. And closed his eyes stayed. When the boss came to find out what had happened, we found that nothing could wake Roland. He tried everything, setting off matches on the backs of his hands, sticking pins in the tips of his fingers. We would find a pistol right next to his ear. But his eyes stayed shut, trembling madly beneath their closed lids. So, the boss called the doctor. The next day, the doctor came in and gave Roland once over and declared even though this man's eyes still tremble he's not breathing and his heart isn't beating he's dead and been that way for more than a day Boys couldn't believe it. Not while Roland's eyes still twitched so furiously. Before long, his body began to smell. And they allowed the mortician to come in.
But even after... Even after his body had been drained of blood and replaced with embalming fluid, his eyes still twitched furiously. They put him in a box and lowered him into the ground, and for three months, Roland Smith dreamed darkly beneath the belly of the earth. Until the worms found their way into the widening holes of his nose and his ears. When the rains came in the spring, the worms carried the dreams to the surface. And then the birds came and carried the worms far across the land until it became nearly impossible to tell where Roland Smith's dreams ended and our world began. And so now you see that it's the earth that dreams darkly. Eyes trembling furiously. Beneath this veil of thin curtains. 